Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's delightful to have everybody here, and I think we're going to see more people walking in, so we'll just get started, though. Um, I'm Sue Baumgarten. I'm the president of Women in Philanthropy, and um, it is my great privilege uh, and pleasure to welcome you and to introduce our program this evening. And uh, I'd like to open by saying Happy Earth Day and how appropriate that today is Earth Day as we are discussing this topic, thriving in a hotter LA, turning Los Angeles into a global model for urban sustainability. And as always the case at UCLA, we are so fortunate to have a really distinguished panel to discuss this topic, and we have uh, individuals who are not only knowledgeable, but also um, renowned in their fields to discuss uh, this topic. And um, our event today is co-sponsored by Women in Philanthropy and also by um, the Institute, UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. And if you hear us all saying I-O-E-S, um, that is so we don't have to always say Institute of Environment and Sustainability. And you say I-O-E-S, is that correct? Okay. Um, so that is um, what we will be talking about. These are the uh, two organizations that are sponsoring this event. And there is information about both organizations around the tables in the room, and please do take some information. I think you will find that both organizations are really worth knowing more about. I'm going to take a few minutes and tell you about the two organizations, and then we'll move right on to the program. Um, we are, as I said, co-sponsoring. The first organization co-sponsoring is Women in Philanthropy um, at UCLA. And what we do is we uh, celebrate and inspire women's giving across the campus. And we also foster women's participation on leadership boards uh, and advisory boards on the campus as well. Um, the group celebrates this year our 20th anniversary. And we have been, therefore, involved since 1994. And what we have been able to do um, is contribute $161 million to UCLA over that time. Um, we have touched just about every um, corner of this campus with the giving. Um, each woman is able to give to what she is most interested and passionate about. Uh, we really are an extraordinary group of women, if I do say so myself. Um, we have women in leadership roles on many of the advisory leadership groups here at UCLA. I think actually now on all of the leadership advisory groups at UCLA. And some of our women hold positions within the UCLA Foundation as well. Um, our partner and co-sponsor in this event is the UCLA Institute of Environment and Sustainability, as I mentioned. They generate knowledge and provide solutions for regional and global environmental problems. Their research program focuses on critical environmental challenges, including climate change, air and water quality, biodiversity and conservation, energy, coastal and water resources, urban sustainability, corporate sustainability, and environmental economics. Much of the research is supported and coordinated by their eight research centers. We really are thrilled this evening uh, to showcase the first UCLA Grand Challenges initiative. And that is an exciting thing to be a part of. So we are all a part of that first showcase, which is wonderful. Um, I think you may have heard that the White House defines Grand Challenges as ambitious yet achievable goals to solve society's biggest issues, disease, illiteracy, inequality, and inaccessibility to clean water. Uh, through innovation and breakthroughs in science, technology, and implementation strategies. Uh, the UCLA Grand Challenges Initiative connects faculty, students, and supporters uh, from a breadth of disciplines working together to solve critical issues. 
The university will take a holistic approach to research, bringing passionate participants together to dream big and think about what they can achieve with their sights set on common goals. For the first grand challenge, UCLA will develop with partners across sectors and communities a comprehensive plan to achieve self-sufficiency in energy and water in Los Angeles by the year 2050. That's 50, not 15. 2050. <laughs> Um, the LA region is uh, already experiencing some of the impacts of climate change. We can expect to encounter increases in temperature, sea level rise, wildfire frequency and size, as well as decreased local snowfall and changes to the frequency and severity of extreme weather events. Presenters on this panel are internationally recognized experts from various units at UCLA who will share information about this first grand challenge and how UCLA is leading cutting edge research and solutions on self-sufficiency. Um, to introduce our panel and to get things rolling, I would like to introduce Tina Quinn. Um, Tina is IOES Advisory Board Chair. Um, she is also a co-founder and current board member of the Sustainable Conservation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the notion that true sustainability has to balance both environmental and economic needs. By engaging the private sector to help design solutions that not only address environmental issues, but create economic incentives for businesses, lasting impact can be realized. Um, Tina is uh, important in the UCLA family, and her family has been involved in philanthropy at UCLA for many years and is the sponsor of the Oppenheim Lecture mm -hmm. Series. Tina is the daughter of Women in Philanthropy founding member and lifetime honorary board member Pat Oppenheim, who is a friend to many of us. She, uh, Tina, is an industrial property manager in Orange County and an independent real estate broker, and she believes passionately that the greatest leverage for environmental change lies in education and that UCLA's IOES is vital to that effort. And with that, I will bring up Tina to get this panel going. Thank you all very much. Well, it is an honor to be here. I, uh, I'm always a little intimidated when somebody reads a resume about you. Uh, I really just wanted to tell everybody that I became board chair in January of the IOES, and I am passionate about interdisciplinary work, and these amazing, talented people up here that we're about to hear from embody what that looks like. Um, and everywhere we look right now, people are talking about the environment. and. A lot of it has to do with drought today and climate change, but really every one of these issues is so multifaceted that an academic institution like UCLA is the place where we're really going to see some change potential happen. And when I talk to the faculty, when I talk to the students, it makes me want to be more involved. It gets me excited about what we see for the future rather than all the dreary stuff that we keep hearing about. I feel inspired by the creativity and the passion that our board has, that these faculty have, and that the students have. So I took this position not because I raised my hand, but because I feel so strongly that this is the place and the time for UCLA to be a leader in what we are seeing in Los Angeles, in Southern California, in the state of California, and across the country. And um, so let's see. The Oppenheim Lecture Series is, has some pretty spectacular speakers if you haven't had a chance to go. We would love to have you attend. The next speaker is one of our own professors, Tom Smith, who will be speaking about his project in the Cameroon. And it's pretty amazing stuff that we have going on there. Um, April 30th, the lecture starts at 7 o'clock. And you can find it online at our website. Hopefully, most of you have received an email about it already. But if not, please come talk to me or any of these people up here afterwards, and we'd love to tell you about it. 
So uh, it is, it is, we have our token mail up here. <laughs> And I just have to give you two minutes. I don't have his bio. He told me not to read his bio. But we grabbed him from Heal the Bay two years ago after he was a board member with me and many of us on our board. And um, we took him away to become the associate director at the Institute. But this guy is talented and he's hardworking. And um, he and I talk a couple times a week on ideas and strategies, and he has a very dry sense of humor, which is a joy, and mostly he's a great friend and a good partner to work with. So, Mark Gold. Thanks, Tina. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking a, an evening off and, join, and sharing your Earth Day evening with us. Uh, we appreciate it. This should be a really interesting discussion. Um, you're probably going to, if this is going to work well, you're going to hear less of me and more of them. Um, and I think that should help. I'm going to give a brief introduction um, if you are more interested in the sort of work that these four do. Um, there's lots of places to find it out. Um, uh, you had a really great overview of what the Grand Challenge is all about. Uh, a group of us um, worked about 15 months in putting together that crazy, audacious challenge. And one of the reasons we did that is we felt like really all the environmental problems in the world are pretty much located here in LA. Gee, we're just so lucky about that. <laughs> And so the thought is, with the tremendous expertise that so many of our faculty have here at UCLA, um, that there's a real good opportunity to work on Los Angeles regional environmental sus sustainability right here in our backyard. And if we could really make a big difference here, then obviously that's a great model for the rest of the world. And so that, that's the thought that went behind it. Um, and the other thing is just through this process of putting this together um, and working with the Vice Chancellor for Research's office, is that we found out that uh, there are so many different faculty on this campus that are already working in related areas. Um, and so there was about 120 faculty have expressed an interest in participating in the Grand Challenge. And that's incredible. If you know university faculty, getting three to agree on something is tough enough. So to get 120 to say that they're interested in a topic is, is definitely a very big deal. So with that, let me do quick intros um, for our four uh, faculty members here, and then start, start with questions. So um, on our, uh, your left, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, uh, we have Professor Radna Tripathi. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences and a joint appointment with the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences and part of the IOES as well. She's a climate scientist that focuses on clumped isotope analysis to study past climate trends in the US, China, Indonesia, Europe, and the poles, polar regions. Her research on paleoclimate enables her to better understand current climate change impacts on both marine and terrestrial environments. She's also researched ocean acidification and the causes and consequences of rapidly rising CO2 levels. Next up, we have uh, Kara Horowitz. She's a Bruin Law School graduate. <laughs> Um, she's also co-executive director of the Emmett Institute on Climate Change and the Environment in the UCLA School of Law. I got that right, right? Am I the first person to say that publicly? <laughs> um, Kara focuses on advancing law and policy solutions to the climate change crisis and in training the next generation of leaders in creating those solutions. Prior to joining the faculty, she spent years saving the whales as a staff attorney at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Next up is Stephanie Pincel, another Bruin. Um, she's a director and professor in residence of the California Center for Sustainable Communities. Um, and she's also an IOES core faculty member. She's published extensively on issues of urban sustainability, environmental policies, and regulation. And the content of her research is generally land use, land use change, energy and water use, with a focus on urban environments and the transformation of the natural environments. She has ongoing research funded by the California State Energy Commission, developing an urban metabolism framework for state energy analysis 
um, and it's uh, also funded by NSF um, on coupled human natural urban systems. And finally, uh, we have uh, Hilary Godwin, who's a professor in environmental health sciences, as well as the associate dean for academic programs in the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Um, she's a member of the California Nanosystems Institute as well. Her research focuses on the molecular toxicology of engineered nanomaterials and development of assays for detection and analysis of infectious diseases. She collaborates with uh, Professor Tim Malloy from the law school on the development and analysis of new approaches to nanoregulatory policy and the assessment of alternatives for hazardous substances. And finally, she also works actively with local organizations like the LA County Department of Public Health and community groups to prepare for and diminish the impact of climate change on public health. So it's a pretty esteemed faculty group that we have here. Um, and with that, let's uh, jump into the questions. All right, Stephanie, you're going to lead us off. So grab a mic. Um, so two of the main grand challenge goals are in the energy and water arena. Can you tell us about what you and your colleagues are doing in terms of energy and water research that will help Los Angeles get to 100% renewable energy and 100% local water? And what are some of the highlights of what you've done on urban sustainability that will help on this grand challenge? It's a long question. Uh, so thank you, Mark. Um, we're actually doing something that seems totally obvious, but that has never been done. So I came to this question very naively, and I thought using this urban metabolism idea to describe LA County, energy, water, and other flows into the county, how those flows are used, where, by whom, to do what, like just like your body, and the waste flows out, could to help us really begin to identify places where um, those resources could be uh, used less, right? By thinking about conservation strategies and rethinking the built environment, how could we actually move to greater sustainability once you knew what was going on in, in the county? Well, much to our surprise, much of that information is very, very, very difficult to get. Um, I'll spare you the very interesting but complex details, but we were finally able to get all of LADWP data for water use for 10 years um, at all uh, addresses, all meters, which we have aggregated to protect customer privacy. I have to add that, don't worry. Um, <clears throat> and all of LADWP electricity data for seven years, and we were finally able to get Edison data and the gas company data. And we're doing the most obvious thing. We're mapping it against um, sociodemographic characteristics, so using the census, um, income, race, ethnicity, education, and so on. And we're mapping it against the county um, tax assessor parcel data. Size of building, age of building, uh, building materials, which makes a huge difference, which you can get through the county assessor data. And we're trying to read that landscape. The water is a very interesting project as well, <clears throat> much more complicated. You may, you may in the back of your mind know that in LA County, there are lots of water purveyors. There are over a hundred water purveyors. Each one of those has a different geographic boundary. They can be wholesale, retail, or nonprofit. A mutual water company is owned by the members and is considered a nonprofit. And to get the simple shape files to map those has taken a year and a half. There's not one place to go for any of that data, let alone how much water is used per capita, except for LADWP, which we have, and we're also collaborating with other mutual uh, municipal water entities. The other thing we're trying to, we've been doing is trying to understand indoor and outdoor water use. And working with um, various colleagues, we're actually able to parse out the indoor versus the outdoor water use, which tells us then a lot about where water is going. With energy, I'll just stop after this. After we've, we realized that with drought restrictions in LADWP territory, people reduced, they were mandatory, and there were price uh, uh, penalties. But people did reduce overall 23% of their outdoor water use without affecting how green the city is. 
So if you look at the kinds of vegetation we have, you think about the climate that we have, and you think, really, we're at all that turf, all that kind of vegetation? If we transform that landscape to more climate-appropriate plants, if we had dual metering indoors and out of doors with different prices so that people could have plenty of water to do our human needs, but maybe watering lawns gets punished a little bit, we could actually reduce our water use tremendously in the region without even going to other uh, more difficult um, um, conservation strategies. And there are lots of those too. So that's very a very high and brief um, outline of the work that I do. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I think we were told we should try to eat the mic a little bit closer. Okay. Um, sorry about that, audience. Uh, one quick follow-up question, Stephanie. So obviously, the big data um, in, in the analysis there has tremendous potential as well um, for moving us forward on reduction of not only energy use for greenhouse gases, yes. um, which is critical to meeting this grand challenge. Any, any quick thoughts on that? Sure. There's a very close connection between energy consumption by the um, built environment and greenhouse gas emissions. As, so knowing more about that re the built environment will also help us target um, huge reductions in that, in that arena. And then you can also couple um, transportation data on top of that. So what we're doing, what we're developing, I think, is a framework of um, data points that you can actually build a very thick description of the county from and then query it with these different kinds of questions based on the empirical data that we're collecting. That's great, thank you. So you can imagine a game plan for each and every city and the county on how to move forward on greenhouse gas emissions reductions. All right, Aradna, um, as you know, the, the real reason for the grand challenge itself is, is the impacts on climate change in Los Angeles. That was uh, the Alex Hall study really got everybody thinking about what we can really do about that. You heard earlier, in the presentation that we're gonna be living in a much hotter Los Angeles and more fire and all sorts of other um, impacts such as that. Um, what are you and your colleagues doing on climate change research that will inform the grand challenge efforts moving forward? And how will this research help us understand climate change impacts around the world? Yeah, thanks Mark. So there are several questions that my colleagues and I uh, here at UCLA are interested in. Specifically, we're interested in the numbers. How warm is it going to get in the decades ahead? How dry is it gonna get? What are gonna be the statistics of record-breaking or extreme climate events? We're also interested in understanding how do we effectively engage people in this incredibly diverse city with respect to climate change impacts? And then, how do we scale what we learn from that upwards? How do we actually effectively communicate likely climate change impacts on a national level? You can imagine the challenges, again, again given the cultural diversity that we have in the US. So on the scientific front, we're specifically doing two things. First, my lab is building a time machine. <laughs> Uh, actually, we're, uh, we're working with people like Alex Hall and his other colleagues here who, in his essence, have developed time machines. They're developing computer models that can be used for projecting future climates. But what we're actually doing is we're developing data sets that can be used to compare different climate models to so we can figure out which computer models can we have the most confidence in. And the way we do this is we actually reconstruct past environmental variability in places as diverse as Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, the Mojave Desert, maybe further afield as well. We work in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, we're working in central China, Indone in Indonesia. And ultimately, actually, we take then of the state of the art with respect to different chemical tools that we are pioneering here at UCLA in conjunction with colleagues at Caltech. And we are working on materials such as the sediments from lakes and uh, soils from people's backyards, these types of materials, to try to look at the history of temperature and rainfall and storm type events. Now ultimately, uh, if you take 10 different climate models and you look at, you, you ask the question, what do these models predict for 50 years from now? Or what do they predict for 50 years past? You'll see that there's a pretty wide spectrum of responses. They all predict it's gonna get warmer. 
but it's actually the exact numbers that make a difference when it comes to trying to plan. So that gives you a sense of scientifically what we're going after with respect to the grand challenges. All right, thank you. All right, next up, uh, Kara. Um, you received your degree at UCLA, and you've worked in advocacy at the NRDC before you came back um, to work in the law school. What brought you back? And what role will the law school and the Emmett Institute for Climate and the Environment play in making the grand challenge a success? Thanks. So yes, I graduated from the law school um, more than 10 years ago. I won't say how many more than 10 years ago. And I was at the time, I think one of two students. You're way too young for that line. Yeah. <laughs> I had a big birthday this year. I'm feeling, well, anyway, I won't say how many students. I, I think there were maybe two or maybe three students in my graduating class who wanted to do, as I did, environmental law with their degree, um, which turned out to be a good thing when I was job seeking um, because I didn't have that much competition. And I got my dream job after working in various settings. Um, I got my dream job at the Natural Resources <coughs> Defense Council, the beautiful lead platinum rated building on 2nd Street in Santa Monica, if any of you have ever passed it. Um, with windows that open up and ocean breezes, and it was lovely. And I was doing really interesting work in federal court and um, at the UN and in Congress uh, protecting ocean um, and natural resources. And I loved it, and I really actually wasn't looking to leave. And then I got this interesting call from some of my former professors at UCLA saying they had gotten a gift, um, a very generous gift from Dan and Ray Emmett. Some of you may know them. Um, who live in Santa Monica, to start what was then called the Emmett Center on Climate Change and the Environment. And the idea was to create the first center at any uh, a law school in the United States focused on climate law and policy and to build it from the ground up. And they wanted to know if I would come help lead it. And of course, you know, how could I turn down that opportunity? I, it was a really tremendous chance to come back to my alma mater and help them build um, a program that we're continuing to build today I think we're um, creating the best set of faculty focused on climate and energy law at a law school anywhere in the country. We have um, on our faculty today the world's leading expert on China and the environment. This is a guy who ran actually NRDC's Beijing office for seven years before joining academia. Uh, we have the world's leading expert on why international environmental um, treaties and agreements work sometimes and sometimes don't work. Uh, we have somebody who has done a tremendous amount of work on the relationship between federal and state climate policy and, and, and on. Um, and what I love about our faculty is that they're great scholars first, but they're all really passionate, as I am and as I think all of us are here on the stage, about ways to plug their scholarship and their expertise into real world problems. And this is where I'm going to connect it back to the grand challenge. Um, at the law school, we, uh, we work to figure out the regulatory barriers to the solutions that we all know we need to some of our greatest environmental challenges, including climate change. And it turns out regulatory barriers are a big deal. You know, there's a lot to be said for the ways that our kind of law and policy momentum keeps us from making the changes that we need. And I'll give a few examples of the sorts of things we've done at the law school and will ramp up as part of the grand challenge in this area. Um, we have at the law school a great class for students called the Environmental Law Clinic uh, that I co-direct, where we take students and for a semester we pair them up with environmental organizations in need of legal representation and the students act as their lawyers for a semester. And they take on tremendous projects and they get real world experience seeing what it's like to work with decision makers and try and make real change using the tools that we've given them at the law school. Through the clinic, we have figured out, for example, how to change state law to help open up the Los Angeles River to access. Some of you may have seen recent kayaking expeditions on the Los Angeles River, et cetera. It turns out we needed a tweak in state law to allow that to happen, and that's something that our clinic students worked on over many years and finally went up to Sacramento last year and wrote the bill and lobbied for it and, and saw it through. Um, we fought a new coal-fired, um, uh, sorry, a coal mining permit on Hopi and Navajo lands with some Hopi and Navajo residents as our main client. We successfully fought that in federal court a few years back. Um, I've done things for the clinic like represent small island developing states in the UN process who are fighting at the UN level to have their really heartfelt claims about climate change heard in the face of overwhelming opposition. Um, 
And I've traveled with those students to a UNN meeting. I've traveled actually to two, one in Copenhagen and one in South Africa, where the students actually got to sit as credentialed delegates at a table with other delegates fighting over what the UN will or won't do over climate change. And for any of you who have followed the UN processes, I won't say that you know, our students succeeded. We're not there yet, <laughs> right? But they got to see the process work, and I think they came away from that experience with a real sense that um, what you need to do to make real change is actually just show up at the table and, and be engaged. And they came away empowered, able to do that. Um, I'm excited about the Grand Challenge because I think when we're at our best, we're working interdisciplinarily. And, and so I'm looking forward to ways to engage even more so as this goes forward. Great. All right, Hillary, uh -oh. you're up. <laughs> so there will be numerous health impacts of a hotter Los Angeles. Can you please talk about these impacts and let us know what you and the School of Public Health are doing to reduce those potential health impacts in a hotter Los Angeles? Sure, thanks, Mark. So um, first I wanted to say that, that part of the reason, you, as Mark was listing off all our different uh, resumes, it sounded like I didn't belong on this team. And I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to articulate, <laughs> I wanted to articulate, because a lot of times people would say to me, why are you working on public health impacts of climate change? And the reason is probably the same reason that all of you guys are here today, which is that I firmly and passionately believe that we each need to help in the ways that we can. And so this was an opportunity where I saw that my particular skill set, I thought I could bring something to bear on this problem. And it's been one of the most rewarding um, projects that I've worked on um, in my professional career. So I just wanted to, to add that. Um, so, okay, so what, what do we anticipate is gonna happen in terms of climate change and health? Um, we anticipate that it's gonna be very different depending upon which neighborhood you live in. So for people who are living in, for instance, Porter Ranch um, or um, Santa Clarita, we, the impacts that we know from Alex's work are that there are gonna be more extreme heat days, and so we're worried about isolated elderly. We're worried about people who are working outdoors, people working in the construction fields, for instance, making sure that we're reaching out to those people and building resiliency so that um, they don't suffer either unnecessary um, um, health impacts or, at the worst case scenario, unnecessary deaths associated with that. Um, but we also know that those same communities are gonna be really, really impacted um, by the increase in wildfires that we're gonna see in the summer months, and that everyone downwind of them is also gonna see really significant health impacts um, because when we have wildfires, we have, as we all know, really bad air quality. And that has a whole suite of different health impacts, not just respiratory ones, but cardiovascular impacts as well associated with it. Um, and so if you may be thinking like, whew, I'm not living in those areas. Um, unfortunately, as we move from neighborhood to neighborhood in Los Angeles, we see different types of vulnerabilities. So for instance, some of our coastal communities, um, where we don't expect that you're gonna see any hotter days, because we don't really have very many extremely hot days near the coast. Um, but some of the lower lying communities are gonna be very vulnerable to flooding impacts as we see sea level rise um, as a result of climate change. So amongst the coastal communities, we see huge vulnerabilities for some of our poor communities, um, like Wilmington and uh, San Pedro near the, the ports, um, where we have a large percentage of renters in those communities. We really need to work on emergency preparedness efforts and reaching out to community groups in those areas to really prepare them for what we know will be more extreme flooding events. Um, and then for some of the wealthier communities along the coast, we're expecting to see impacts there too. So we have a lot of our infrastructure that's along the coast that's also low lying, our power plants, our sewage treatment plants, and impacts of sea level rise on those facilities are gonna impact all of us that live near the coast. So um, really, like I said, it, it really depends on the neighborhood, but what's great about what's going on at UCLA is we're able to leverage the climatic studies to be able to reach out to specific communities and say, here's what you need to focus on for your particular community. Um, so what are we doing with the LA County Department of Public Health? This is a really fun project. I, actually, some of the doctoral students who are working on the project are, are here in the audience, so just a shout out to them. Um, so uh, we have a partnership with the Department of Public Health where we're doing capacity building. We're helping them to train um, people who work in very different divisions within the Department of Public Health 
about not only what are the projected impacts of climate change, but also how they can leverage their own skills and expertise to help prepare communities for climate change. And this is really important because there are still a lot of people out there, particularly in Los Angeles, who think, okay, climate change may be happening, but it's not necessarily gonna affect me. Um, and we think that public health messaging, talking about the health impacts, is a way that we can engage communities um, that might not necessarily care about some of the other impacts or don't think that they care about the other impacts. So it's a really good mechanism. Um, in addition, those public health professionals work with really vulnerable communities across the county. So they have a great skill set, a great um, outreach that we want to leverage um, to be able to reach those communities and prepare. So um, that, we've been doing that activity of running these um, training workshops. We've done um, 14 of them so far. And then we're, we have a bunch of groups that are actively asking for dissemination of those materials that would like to use them in other contexts. And then we're also working with specific subgroups within the Department of Public Health to pull in other stakeholders across the county that they work um, with in specific topic areas. So one of them um, is vector-borne disease, another one's air quality, um, to make sure that we're developing really detailed health-based plans for the county. So a concrete example would be instead of just saying we want to reduce emissions, to say we want to make sure that we stabilize the number of West Nile virus cases that we have in the county, or preferably even take them back to say 2005 levels. So that's something we anticipate is going to get worse with climate change. We want to actively work to build resiliency so that we can stabilize those levels and not see those increases. So those are the kind of things that we're working with them on. Great to see such a, a proactive, adaptive program with uh, public health. I mean, to think doing that in 2014, it's very, very, very cool. Um, one of the things, though, that's also very positive about this, not to, is that, so if you decarbonize transportation, all of a sudden it's not so horrible to live next to a freeway, is it? Um, and so from that standpoint, right now, where it's one of the least desirable places to live because of air quality impacts and asthma and, and, um, and lung cancer concerns, now if, it, if we have electric transportation, that'll change the game dramatically. So that's one of the exciting things about, about the Grand Challenge. Um, let me follow up with a, a couple of questions. This one in particular for Kara and Stephanie. Um, you, you two worked on the Vision 2021 LA Sustainable City Plan for Los Angeles. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that plan and, and sort of where this fits in from the standpoint of where we really want to go by 2050 through the Grand Challenge? And how are we going to make that happen with our elected officials? Well, I have no idea how to answer that last part of the question. <laughs> but you all can help, I think. Um, but the first part is, so yes, Mark, um, Mark left himself off the list of folks who worked on this incredible project, and so I'm going to add him back in. Mark and Stephanie and I and others at UCLA um, worked on a project we called Vision 2021, which was Los Angeles' first ever sustainability plan, looking at the city as a whole across a wide range of metrics from, you know, what we do with our waste to where we get our water and what we do with it to, you know, what should our um, climate change emissions be and how do we make ourselves more equitable with respect to the different burdens that communities are bearing from environmental pollution, et cetera, et cetera. And we looked at a bunch of these different um, uh, questions and we came up with a holistic plan not on our own but in consultation with more than 50 I don't know how many was it mark set more than 70 different um, community groups and community experts and advocates throughout the city and we asked this question if along each of these measures the city made sort of best possible but practicable effort between now and 2021 how far could we get what could we really practically do? This wasn't a sort of pie in the sky exercise. It was really, given where we are today and what our resources are and what our priorities are, what's, what's feasible? And we put it together in a, in a report and nobody had really ever done that before. And the impetus for our doing this was the last mayoral election. Um, and we put the draft plan in front of each of the candidates for mayor and said, 
would you endorse this plan if you were elected? We really intended to make it a campaign issue, and I think we succeeded. We actually got each of the major candidates to endorse the plan. Uh, we had questions about the plan raised in um, televised debate. And we're now working, you know, we're working with Mayor Garcetti's office, who was one of the candidates who endorsed the plan, to see how we can make it real now that he's in office. And it was a, um, I think it was a good example of the ways that academia can augment the public debate about some of these questions. And I thought it was useful. So we, and, I, and this is thanks actually to Mark's uh, great insight, decided that we would assume that the mayor would get two terms. And really what was so stunning about the process was the work of the law school, but also that um, there are so many things that can be done without enormous amounts of money or enormous amounts of regulatory change. It is actually quite stunning. And so if uh, we can leave you with anything tonight, I think probably looking at the LA 2021 20, plan um, would be very useful because I found it also extremely optimistic. So if you look at the LA 2050 work that was done by, that was um, done by, see, two, there Gold are two Hirsch different, or? the Gold Hirsch group, and then there's also the more recent one that was headed by uh, Austin Butner. You look at 2020. 2020. You look at those, and they're enormously depressing, and everything is kind of bleak and not possible because, because, because. But in fact, there is an enormous amount that can be done, um, and it requires a little bit of courage for sure. Change is not easy, but these are not big, big, big lifts. I'll give you a big lift. Um, a big lift would be. The need, for example, to look at the LA Charter and the way it ha it kind of um, concretizes silos within the city, because the charter tells you how the city is organized. So if you wanted to, for example, which would be a great idea, create a water agency that does water supply, storm water, and sewage, you probably would have to go before the voters and have charter reform. Well, short of that, there's still a lot you can do. So I think what, what the project did, what the planning did, was illustrate the kinds of things that can actually be done now that will take a few years and won't all be easy, but that are feasible. And that, for me, was um, something that we bring to the table. What can you do to make this area more environmentally sustainable? Thank you. Um, obviously, the grand challenge for it to be successful needs to be more than just research and recommendations on change in policy and change in law. It needs to be development of partnerships with uh, local government, state government, and federal government, with business, with other academic institutions, with environmental groups, and the like. Um, and just as important, of course, is educating our own students. So this question for Radna and Hillary. Um, what are you planning to do to better educate our students to become more effective researchers and professionals working on grand challenge issues? And is there anything you'd like to see UCLA do in this area? Okay, so there are actually a whole, whole slew of new classes that uh, we are in the works uh, in terms of developing, some of which will be team taught, uh, some of which will be interdisciplinary, some of which will require uh, research on the part of the faculty to put together. And we are also, for some of these courses, drawing in, uh, or pl and planning to draw in uh, experts from industry, academics, from other institutions that are specialists uh, to participate. For example, uh, this term, I'm actually teaching a course on fracking. I don't work on fracking. I actually know very little about it, relatively speaking. But I'm bringing in people from NRDC, from uh, the from hydrology, people working in public health to talk about the issues pertaining to it within California. And I think in doing such, in doing such, undertaking such efforts, we have a remarkable opportunity to ensure that we are training students students in the sciences, students in the professional schools, so that they have the knowledge that they need to be leaders in our society and be informed. Um, okay, so 
I would say two different, of taking two different approaches in terms of training students. Um, the first would be sort of a more traditional approach in terms of classroom. And actually this quarter I'm, I'm teaching a class jointly with some colleagues in Cameroon and Central Africa where the students here and in Cameroon are, are jointly delving into what are the different challenges that we face um, in terms of environmental health and climate change is one of the areas that we're focusing on very strongly. Um, and what are the commonalities in terms of our challenges and where do we have to sort of pull together to come up with global solutions? Um, and that's a, just an incredibly eye-opening experience, um, not just for the students, but for those of us teaching it as well. Um, it really makes you think differently when you hear questions from people from another country about why is your system the way it is? Why, why have you developed the way you have? Why can't you solve this problem that seems so obvious to us? That's one that the Cameroonian students repeatedly ask me. <laughs> it's like, why are you using so much water if you don't have enough water? Um, <laughs> so, good question. Um, good question, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's one, one approach and, and that has been um, very fun, I think, and helpful for the students in terms of um, helping them place their everyday life in, in a different context. Um, and then the other one is the working with the doctoral students on this project with the Department of Public Health. So um, it's been a huge amount of work running all these workshops and developing the materials for them and certainly not something that I could have done on my own. And I have this wonderful group of um, between six and eight doctoral students who are deeply involved in various aspects of climate uh, change and health. And um, I sort of dragged them a little unwillingly into this, the workshop program. I remember one of them asking me, when are we gonna be done with this? And I said, when we're done. <laughs> uh, but now I'm, I'm ready to be done with the workshop phase. <laughs> I'm 14 workshops later. Um, but I mean, they can answer better and hopefully you'll get a chance to talk to them. I think there's a reception that follows. Um, but, what I see is there have just been incredibly important professional development opportunities for them. So they have an opportunity to present science and to communicate science and information that we have from the academic setting to practitioners to learn how to um, shape their messages in a way that will be effective for a different type of audience than they're used to talking to. Um, and um, importantly, as they've gone through that process, I think they've made some really critical connections with people in the practice community that for each of those students have really helped them in terms of pursuing their own doctoral research. So we're starting to see big time the payoff in terms of them having access to people in public health, um, in the Department of Public Health in ways um, that would have been very difficult prior to launching the project. So it's, it's been a great project from that respect. Thank you. Um, some of the suggestions that I've heard from other faculty on the grand challenges, you know, that might make a big difference is if we have an energy or a water or sustainability or a climate minor um, at UCLA. Right now, we don't have that. Um, people can sort of do that. Students can do that on their own, but there's no formal mechanism to do so. And, um, you know, maybe creating a program like sustainability fellows that are multidisciplinary and working in multiple departments and schools across campus. So those are the sorts of things people are talking about right now. Um, and uh, also uh, the vice chancellor for research uh, is, is uh, wants to invest and is investing some funds and having um, undergraduates work with a number of faculty um, on grand challenge oriented issues as early as the fall. Um, so they're working on putting that program together right now to sort of change the way we're doing um, education. All right, so I'm already getting warnings in the back um, from the standpoint of timing. Uh, can we do real quick, two quick questions? Um, uh, so the first one will be to Stephanie and Kara, and then the last one will be to all of you. And, and if we can keep the question, the answers down to about a minute. What, what do you think the biggest obstacles are to actually succeeding in the grand challenge? If you were to pick them personally, is it funding? That would probably be a big one right now. Uh, technology, legal and regulatory, governance, lack of political will, pick one. So I guess it depends on what you mean by succeeding in the grand challenge. I think getting, I, 
meeting our own UCLA goals for collaboration and work products, et cetera, you, funding is clearly um, something we need. But I see the, big, the grand challenges obviously being broader than that. To actually reach the, the goals we've stated for Los Angeles, political will has to be at the top of the list. Um, and it's partly why we do you know, events like this to talk to folks about what we're up to, and it's partly why I do sort of everything I do at the law school that relates to public education. We need much better public understanding of the importance of these issues before we're gonna get there. Great. I would agree with Kara, and one of the things that we've been doing at the center is really engaging very deeply with the state legislature and with local and local elected officials. And also people who make decisions in all of these departments and agencies that affect the environment. I think that what you need to be, what we need to be, the big challenge is really showing a pathway that can work and constructing that in a non-threatening but deliberate manner. So, you know, showing who uses how much energy where is already, it's like a simple thing, but then you begin to think about, well, if we do this, maybe they'll reduce, you know, that kind of thing. But we need leadership, we need, we need courage. We really need a lot of courage. Thank you. All right, so to, to wrap us up before we open up a couple questions from the audience is, um, why are these issues so important to you personally, and why should everyone in the audience care? Well, I think, I think if you are aware of these issues and you're aware of the, the scale of the impacts, how can you not act, right, in any way that you can? In some sense, we're complicit if we don't do anything. There's so many different ways you can act. Anything you do from having conversations with people, that serves in terms of education, right? That can make a difference. Doing research on various aspects. There's just, there's so many ways we can, we can act. So I think there's, there are environmental reasons, there are moral reasons, there are social justice reasons to, to do so. Yeah, just round the horn. Uh, so I've cared a about these issues for a very long time. Um, but I now have two children, so I care about them even more. And like many of you, I live in one of those neighborhoods that's now sort of throwing distance from the 405. Uh, Mark talked about some of the things that those of us who work in this field are all too aware of when you live that close to a freeway, air pollution, asthma rates, et cetera. And so this, I see the work that I do at UCLA and the program that we're building here as um, one way to help make the city better, certainly for all of us who live here, but I do, I do kind of selfishly think about my children. <laughs> it's true, I do. That's a, it's a big question, actually. But I'm gonna take a different tack, because I agree with both of what you said. But I also think there's this other part of it, and that is beauty. We, I'm a native Californian. This, this state is splendid. And we really should treat it, and ourselves, with dignity and grace and honor and respect. I mean, this, life is precious. And so why do we do things without thinking? So that, that motivates me a great deal, is just the sense of both human respect and the respect of nature and the question of beauty and grace and happiness, really. OK. Um, so it's to echo a little bit of what, what you've heard already, um, so I too grew up in Southern California. I'm actually fourth generation Southern Californian, and so my son is now fifth generation. And a lot of times people ask me, like, why don't you just leave if it's so, you know, climate change is going to be so bad there. And my response is, this is my home. This is my community. The Los Angeles is, is where I want my children's children to grow up, and I want it to be the same amazing place that it has been for me and that it is currently for my son. Um, and I see so many improvements that we've made even just since I was a kid. Um, we don't have smog days anymore. Um, the air quality is so much better and that's directly as a result of actions that people took doing basic science and a lot of people actually at UCLA doing basic science and communicating that science to the people who were making the decisions to affect change that then improved the quality of life and the health of Southern Californians. And I think we have the opportunity to do that again. And I embrace the opportunity to be part of that and we're hoping that all of you do as well. 
Those were four extraordinary answers from four extraordinary people, um, even though Hillary didn't say that the bay is a lot cleaner. Oh, the bay is a lot cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's open it up for a couple questions. I know we're running late, um, but let's try it. Um, do people want to throw a mic around, or how are we going to do this? OK, great. Um, uh, just pick. Go. <laughs> I um, well, I want to say thank you. That was a, a wonderful um, discussion to hear from everybody. I was curious, I guess this is my question is for Stephanie Pinsetta. There's, I, Could you talk a little bit about LARC and how your work um, informs the work that they're doing, having worked for a local jurisdiction and having participated in that as a member? Um, I know that they're working on a climate action plan. And could you speak to that? Thank you for setting me up. Um, <laughs> that's a wonderful question. So what what she's referring to is, a, is the Los Angeles Regional Collaborative for Climate Action and Sustainability. And it is a remarkable endeavor to try to transcend the jurisdictional boundaries in LA, we have 88 cities and so on, to come together around organizing um, best management practices and consensus to move the region forward to address issues of climate. It's housed at UCLA in my center because we're, and including my colleagues, are imparting science and knowledge to this group of this organization that consists of the city of LA, the county of LA, so the public health department of the county of LA, the, M, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, and so on, and nonprofit organizations and some business organizations that come together to talk about really what are the best management practices that we can try to diffuse throughout the region that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and make the region more resilient? And it's a fabulously collaborative or group of people um, representing these organizations who, who really are dedicated to coming together around this issue and move the region forward. So thank you very much for asking the question. Right there, next question. I'd like to know if you have any ideas or solutions yet for the rising seawater that we're, you referred to uh, low-lying areas, the port specifically. Uh, did you want me to talk about what's going on? Okay. Yeah, sure. So I can only tell you. Actually, Mark could yeah. probably address it. Yes. Mark, why don't we yeah, let you Mark do this? Come the, on, Mark. You're the, the sea guy. <laughs> I, I know for a fact you two are both working on it, so it's not my <laughs> night, it's your night. So take okay. a shot. Okay, all right. So um, obviously there are building infrastructure things that can be done. I guess what, what I would like to emphasize is that that's not enough. So for instance, things like building seawalls or retaining walls or engineering is not enough. Um, clearly we're going to have to deal with some of the infrastructure issues that I, that I mentioned. For instance, um, um, power plants and, and uh, sewage, treatment. sewage treatment plants that are down low intentionally um, that are going to be um, vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, and then we're also really going to have to focus on preparing the communities that we know are at greatest risk. So there's been some great mapping projects looking at where we predict at different, you know, at 10 year floods, 100 year floods. Um, thousand year floods, each of which are becoming more and more common, um, which areas we predict will be flooded. And we need to get into those communities and start building awareness and making sure that people are building their own resiliency, that they have their own plans, and that they are connected to the resources that they need in order to be able to get out when they need to. Okay. I don't know. I, well, my question is a little bit even more. Um, we are, I am also a native second generation, and I do have a love for my city, but we have a very heterogeneous population. We're not Cameroon. We're not a country where people have been for generations. So what do you think you can do to get into these communities that really people have no concept of saving water or recycling? I mean, we have a lot of neighborhoods that you go through. Okay. I mean, that's basically, I think it's important to get to the lower reaches of our city everywhere else. Well, you, you might be very interested in the results of our mapping. Because what it does show is that actually affluent people use a lot more water and a lot more electricity than lower income people, even if there's large family sizes. 
So we are caught kind of on the horns of a dilemma, right? So those who can afford the least use the least because they just can't afford to use more. And those who can afford to use more use a lot. So how do you change those behaviors, even if they may know or be more informed? But that's not even a necessary given because what has been shown through surveys is that the lower income people of color tend to vote more in greater percentages for environmental conservation than their older white counterparts who are more educated. So there's a whole set of issues there that are very interesting to tease out. You ask a very good question because it illustrates probably the need for the kind of work that we're doing in order to provide more empirical data to think about the kinds of policies that are going to be the most effective for those who are actually the bigger problem in terms of consumption. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so California water rights law is a behemoth. And if you'd asked me two years ago whether there was any realistic prospect of changing the way that water rights are delineated in California, I would have said no. And I would st I'll still say that it's an uphill battle today because of the many entrenched and politically powerful interests um, that align behind those water rights. However, we're in a tremendous drought. And I've had more conversations with folks who are in Sacramento and working in Sacramento these days about the ways that we can turn this drought into an opportunity to address or readdress our water rights in novel ways um, than I can, you know, than I can count in the last few months. Um, at the law school, we've looked a lot at, for example, the way that groundwater is. I'm going to say monitored and metered out in California, but what I really mean by that is completely unmonitored and not metered out at all. <laughs> and we've done a, a project that shows, for example, that California is the least regulated state, including Texas, <laughs> when it comes to regulating groundwater usage, which is crazy. It's a public resource. Um, and the law in California is basically you drill and you take it, and you don't have to tell anybody how much you're taking, and um, we're, we're clearly, I think, coming to the end of an era where that kind of Western frontier menta mentality um, is viable. And yeah, we're doing some work to change it, but I think it's an uphill battle. Yeah, I think it goes back to what you said earlier. It still boils down to political will. I mean, the good news is everybody's finally discussing it and facing up to it. But the political will in the state legislature, as you know, still isn't there. Um, it'll be interesting to see. What's going to push it over? Uh, yeah. Perhaps part of the issue, um, and you all addressed it in certain ways, the feasibility aspects, and I think that, that political will is a significant part of that. I'm curious to know whether you feel in some ways hamstrung by that, and how would your teaching, how would your education change if somehow you could wave, you could wave a magic wand and not have to worry about it? What would your approach be that would be different? Well, uh, Stephanie, I'm sure, has a great response to this, and I want to hear what it is, but I just want to say something, that there are a whole series of problems that our society in the US has faced over the last 200 years, where the solutions seemed at the time to be out of reach, too expensive, unfeasible. They, they're not there. You know, We can look at. Uh, arguments that were made with respect to civil rights for women, for people of color, um, with respect to child labor laws. We can look at environmental issues of the late 20th century with respect to DDT. We can, you know, with respect to CFCs in the ozone hole. And time and time again, we've shown we can innovate, right? And that it's important to have public awareness. <laughs> it's important to have communications and small scales, to have community activists, to look at 
have people in organizations that are looking how do you translate that to policy on a larger scale. And time and time again, we have shown we can beat down these challenges that had at the time seemed com completely unsolvable. So in a very small example, one of my greatest delights when I teach this class on environmental policies and governance is I make my students go to a public hearing as part of their class, um, what they have to do. And you get the most, it just like a whole world opens up for them. They say, can I go to a public hearing? Can I speak at a public hearing? And they get so turned on at understanding that you can actually participate in the democratic process. And part of, I think, what, what you're pointing out is we've lost that reflex. And one of the things that we can do at the university is encourage students to know, learn, and participate, whatever they choose to do with it, but to understand we have an active democracy. And the less we participate, the less we're able to do those things. The more we are active within our democracy, the more then we can make those changes. So that's a really fun, um, fun, fun thing that I, I get to do. Um, last question. These are very ambitious goals that you have, and I'm curious to know more about how you propose to fund, and and how much is it going to cost? <laughs> uh, yeah, great. So I, I can't pass the buck, I guess, on this one. Um, th this is probably as big a grand challenge as actually reaching the goals of the grand challenge, um, because the exciting thing about it is that we have the faculty expertise to really take on something of this scope and scale. Um, clearly, as you guys are demonstrating tonight, um, as, a, as a very engaged audience, we have a UCLA community that supports this um, in a real big way. Um, we have a mayor in Los Angeles who has talked about um, urban sustainability more than any other mayor so far. Um, and so that's, there are exciting times in that regard. Um, but it's not, people can't do research for free. Um, and so the estimates that we've seen are not cheap. To do uh, the research planning that we've been talking about, um, which requires a great deal of work in the engineering realm, which we haven't really spent too much time on, um, on everything from water quality to uh, renewable energy to smart grid breakthroughs and a wide variety of different things that um, are going on right now on campus as we speak. Um, that we're talking about something in around the 120 to 150 million dollar range. Um, and there's no way that's going to happen alone with private philanthropy. Um, uh, it's going to have to be part of it. Um, I think uh, it may even need to lead by example. But if there's not going to be support from the federal government, if they're from whether it's NSF or um, Department of Energy, or Department of Interior, um, those are possibilities. Uh, the Vice Chancellor of Research's office just led a trip back to Washington, D.C. We had some good meetings with those folks. Um, our own state of California, if you think about AB 32 funds, they don't all have to go to high-speed rail, do they? Um, they could go to um, things that are really going to make a difference on greenhouse gas emission reductions here in Los Angeles. Um, and the same thing goes for California Energy um, Commission, Public Utilities Commission funding, Prop 39 funding um, to really help on our, uh, on our schools and turning them around from the standpoint of energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm sorry it's a long-winded answer, but no one's going to turn around and give us $150 million to UCLA tomorrow. Um, and it's going to really take a huge amount of effort to make this happen, um, and that's that's where we are right now. And so getting the word out and talking to people like we are here tonight um, is a great, great step that we need to do and move forward. And very, very soon we'll have somebody working on Grand Challenge full time on the development sector, as well as there'll be somebody full time working on actually managing the project. Um, and so I think that is something that will help tremendously as well. We have the leadership of the chancellor. Um, behind this. He's the one who announced this and is really super excited about this. The Vice Chancellor of Research, um, Jim Economou, has also um, really put his neck out there really far, um, front and center. Um, and that's, for this campus, that matters an awful lot in moving forward. 
Okay. Um, I think we are very, very fortunate to have been involved in this informative, diverse, and yet integrative discussion. And it reminds me of what is so uniquely UCLA, and that is that promotion of excellence in individual disciplines, but we look at and embrace interdisciplinary solutions. And thank you so much for being a part of that. Thank you. And I believe our panelists will be able to stay for a little while. And we do have a reception set up. We'd like you all to join us for that. And hopefully, you'll have a chance to talk some more with our panelists. And thank you all for being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun to hear. Yeah. It was great to be on the panel with you guys. I know. Yeah, I know.